Those of you who, are, who have been in uh, our programs in the past will recognize the trend. We always have somebody from the lower basin talking to us about the, what we call the big river and the big river issues and some of the challenges and perspectives of from the lower basin of dealing with the river beyond Colorado's borders as a river system, as an entire watershed. Our next speaker um, is Suzanne Tickner. Um, she's the director of water policy for the Central Arizona Project. Before her recent promotion to this position, Suzanne worked as a senior staff attorney for Central Arizona's legal department. Suzanne joined Central Arizona as staff attorney in 1987. Leaving there in 1995, she was named the first manager of the Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District and then returned to Central Arizona's legal department in 2001, where she remains today, but joins us here. Suzanne, thank you. Please welcome Suzanne. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm happy to see new faces, although it's hard to see because the lights are very bright. Um, I am excited to be a part of this program, and I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share um, a message from the entity that I represent, Central Arizona Project. Um, I'm also really grateful um, to escape the Phoenix heat for a day or two and come up here to uh, beautiful Grand Junction. Um, so uh, my task today, according to the program, is to describe how the lower basin is attacking the structural deficit. I would, um, when I was thinking about the word attack, um, um, I actually think we're sort of more yielding um, in many ways to very sobering and harsh realities of the structural deficit and the, the drought. Um, we are, of course, using focused energy and effort then to create plans to manage for the significant risks that are posed by the structural deficit. So today I will be first outlining what the structural deficit is, how it impacts the entire Colorado River Basin, in case there's any newcomers to the room that haven't heard about this. I then will be providing an overview of two current programs in the lower basin, um, which have demonstrated that conservation can help to address declining reservoir elevations in Lake Mead. Those two programs alone have added about five feet of storage in Mead and have averted a lower basin shortage this year and next year. Uh, finally, I will conclude with a brief discussion of um, a proposal that's under negotiation among the lower basin states in the United States called the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan. Um, before going there, though, um, I'd like to talk a little bit just very briefly about the entity that I represent, the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, is commonly known as the CAP. Um, the CAP is a Bureau of Reclamation water delivery system. Um, it delivers a portion of Arizona's entitlement to cities, agricultural users, and tribes in Central and Southern Arizona. Um, it's managed, it's maintained and operated by CAWCD or CAP, and we are the repayment entity responsible for paying the uh, reimbursable construction costs of the reclamation system. So here's a system map of the Central Arizona project. Um, we, it diverts water at Lake Havasu on the Colorado River, transports it 336 miles, all the way down to a point south of Tucson. Um, it consists of 14 pumping plants that lift water about 3,000 feet. Um, the, we annually deliver an average of 1.4 million acre feet per year. Um, we deliver to 10 large irrigation districts, 11 tribes, and have over 50 municipal and industrial uh, subcontractors. And anyone from Arizona can't talk about the CAP for very long without 
mentioning um, that the CAP holds a junior priority entitlement in the lower basin, um, which means that in times of shortage, the CAP could be cut to zero before um, California would suffer any reductions. That is described as the price Arizona paid for authorization of construction of the CAP. So getting now to the heart of the matter, the problem, <clears throat> the lower basin and um, really Arizona and specifically the central Arizona project face a monumental problem. The Colorado River system is in a fragile straight state due to years of drought and due to the structural deficit. Lake Mead is in critical decline. Um, uh, there is significant uncertainty about what actions the Secretary of Interior will take if the elevations in Mead continue to decline. This is one of the principal drivers that have brought representatives from the lower basin states in the United States to the table to start seriously discussing programs um, to manage the problem and the risk. And because of CAP's junior priority, the focus of many of these risks is really falling on the Central Arizona project and its users. So the structural deficit, what is the structural deficit? The term structural deficit refers to the fact that the lower basin uses about 1.2 million acre feet every year more than it receives from Lake Powell and side inflows. Um, it is tempting for some people in the lower basin to assume that the critical declines in Lake Mead are really, have been the result of the drought that we have seen. Um, but the simple fact is that the lower basin uses annually more water than the system provides. More than 600 acre feet are lost each year due to evaporation in Mead. Um, there's an additional 600 acre feet that is lost downstream of Mead from system losses. The result is a structural deficit that causes um, Lake Mead to decline by 12 feet per year. Um, when we receive normal releases of 8.23 million acre feet each year from Powell. <clears throat> Even in years when um, Powell is releasing, is making balancing releases of about 9.9 uh, million acre feet per year, uh, Lake Mead continues to decline about four feet per year. Um, the, 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 the result of this structural deficit is that it drives the lower basin towards shortage. Because shortage in the lower basin is largely the responsibility of CAP and its water users, the practical re result is that the Central Arizona project um, is forced to bear the obligation of the evaporation losses in Mead, the system losses below Mead, and the lower basin share of the Mexico Treaty obligation. <clears throat> so here's uh, this graphic depicts uh, the impact that the drought and the structural deficit has had um, on the two uh, large reservoirs um, starting at the turn of the century when those reservoirs were effectively full um, to where we are today with Powell at 54% uh, and Mead at 37% full. So uh, this graphic shows the, uh, the levels of Lake Mead since 2000. It's important to remember that during this period of time, releases from Powell have been, in all years except one, have been at a minimum normal of 8.23 million acre feet. Um, and yet, the uh, elevation of Mead has fallen by more than 130 feet during this period of time. This is due to the structural deficit. The lower basin has not been in shortage. We've been receiving normal releases. So there's another, um, there's another piece that I just need to provide a little bit of background to you all before moving forward to a discussion of the 
programs, um, and that's the 07 guidelines. In 2007, the Basin States reached agreement on coordinated operation of Lake Mead and Lake Powell and how the lower basin states were gonna share shortages. Um, in addition to providing rules for conjunctive management of the reservoirs, the guidelines provided for voluntary reductions of lower basin deliveries when water levels in Lake Mead reached specific trigger elevations. The guidelines also provided that Arizona and Nevada only would be the ones that would share those reductions. Deliveries to California are not cut. That's an acknowledgement of CAP's junior priority. Um, also in 2012, Mexico and the United States um, negotiated uh, Minute 319 to the 1944 Treaty. Um, in this minute, Mexico agreed to accept reduced deliveries as well um, in accordance, uh, consistent with the elevation triggers uh, specified in the guidelines. And so uh, the table here shows the, the trigger elevations and the reductions of the states and Mexico. <clears throat> so there are significant consequences um, of Lake Mead decline. The first part of this uh, slide is kind of CAP centric. Um, it shows the uh, Arizona reductions at 1075 and at 1050 and at 1025. Um, at 1050, however, um, those reduction, we will also see not just a reduction in water supply, there's a reduction in hydropower generation at Hoover. At, at tw 1025, there's that significant uncertainty that I mentioned before about what action or actions the secretary may take to address the low reservoir elevations. Um, there's also a potential loss of hydropower generation at Hoover at this elevation. At 1,000 feet, um, active storage in Lake Mead is less than Cal California's annual entitlement. It's the run of the river operations and there's just not enough water to um, meet the deliveries of the lower basin entities. At 895, it's Deadpool. <clears throat> so, the risk. Uh, CAP in particular faces what my boss is now referring to as an existential threat. Um, CAP is at risk of having to take reductions so severe that they dramatically impact Arizona's entire economy, the society, thank you, <clears throat> society and the, and the environment. <clears throat> the risk um, is relatively is a rel is relatively low probability risk, but our modeling and analysis shows us that if the risk the, the risk could develop quickly, um, and it could develop in the relatively near future. Water managers have been aware of these risks for some while, for some period of time, and they've developed programs to. Um, try to address some of the risks. <clears throat> Excuse me. In Arizona, um, the state has stored more than more than 3.4 million acre feet underground um, in uh, CAP in cooperation with the Arizona Water Banking Authority, stored water in underground aquifers. This water is stored for future times of shortage for recovery to supplement the reduced supplies during shortage. Um, we've also participated with other basin states in augmentation, cloud seeding programs, and with um, uh, research projects about uh, local and binational desal projects. But today I'm really gonna be talking about the, the lower three initiatives on this slide. Um, the Basin Drought Response Actions Memorandum of Understanding, which is the MOU, um, and the pilot system conservation program. And finally, the lower basin drought contingency plan, which is the, um, those are the discussions that are currently pending. So first, to start out with the, um, the memorandum of understanding. This is a member of a, um, an agreement that was entered into in 2014 by the United States Bureau of Reclamation, Southern Nevada Water Authority, C Central C CAP, and um, MWD of California. The agreement targeted conservation goals to create um, conservation storage in Lake Mead to prop up the elevation of the lake, um, 
the goal was to achieve about 740,000 acre feet of conservation, of system conservation. Um, each individual party made its own goals and commitments. You'll see those commitments here on the slide. Um, uh, CAP's commitment was to contribute 345,000 acre feet of system conservation. Um, <clears throat> CAP's goal will be, its target will be met by the end of this year. This is a table showing um, what the MOU conservation projects in Arizona and CAP have been. Um, and just very briefly, I'm going to uh, uh, describe three of the projects. Um, the first one, CAP paid um, some of its ag users agreed to voluntarily forbear a portion of their CAP ag pool deliveries in exchange for a reduction in price for the balance of their deliveries. Um, we also had several m and customers that were able to accept a local supply in lieu of their CAP supply. Um, and also th there's a three-year pilot following program that um, the Groundwater Replenishment District, which is a function of CAP, entered into with Yuma Mesa Irrigation and Drainage District. Um, down in the Yuma area, in which farmers agreed to voluntarily forbear um, or to fallow land that otherwise would have been farmed. Um, about 1,500 acres were fallowed, um, which was about 10% of the irrigated acreage in the district. <clears throat> this is just a slide showing who the participants are. Um, we like to show this slide in Arizona so the folks get credit that um, have stepped forward and, and cooperated with us to help us achieve our goal of conserving 345,000 acre feet in Mead. <clears throat> the next program that I'd like to discuss is the Pilot System Conservation Program. Um, this is a, a, uh, a program across the upper and lower basin. Um, it has its participants or funders include um, the United States, Southern Nevada Water Authority again, MWD again, CAP again, and Denver Water. The purpose of this program was to determine whether system conservation programs can be effective, at least to partially mitigate drought impacts. Um, the concept is that in the lower basin state, it's the Bureau of Reclamation that administers the program. They annually call for proposals. Water users submit proposals of how they would reduce their water use. And then the reclamation with the funding partners review the proposals and decide which ones they are going to grant and fund. Um, <clears throat> so the partners make the monetary contributions to the water users that agree to participate in the conservation. Uh, programs. Um, this shows uh, the, the pilot system conservation um, is broken down into phases and that was really largely a function of when federal dollars would come in. Um, so there's, uh, you can see the parties and their relative contributions in this slide. <clears throat> their criteria that the reclamation and the parties look at when trying to decide among all of the proposals which proposals they're going to fund. These are some of the criteria. Of course, we want geographic diversity in the upper and the lower basin. Um, we look at the bang for the buck. Um, we want diversity, different types of conservation proposals, um, the ease of, of implementation and administration. Um, obviously, we don't want to harm third parties in any of these proposals. Um, the ability to, con to quantify actual conservation <clears throat> and the opportunity really to test new ideas. <clears throat> this is a very busy slide. Um, I'm not going to go through it. I, I just included it in case folks are, are really interested in what the details are. Um, but the takeaway on this is that the total funding um, for lower basin system conservation under this pilot system conservation program is about $15.2 million, and we will conserve about 100,000 acre feet of system storage in meat. So this slide, <clears throat> again, shows that um, these conservation programs have been having some impact. 
they have flattened the trend, um, potentially changing the slope at least a little bit. Um, the problem is, however, we still, even with um, normal or balancing releases from Powell, even with the system conservation programs that might be able to prop up the lake one or two feet, we still are losing elevation in Mead every year because of the structural deficit. That means that more must be done. In 2019, we're probably gonna be out of tricks and um, we're probably gonna be in shortage in the lower basin. If not in, you know, we're, we're hoping 2018 will get by, but 2019, um, we're probably gonna see a shortage declaration in the lower basin. So I say more must be done. And this brings me to the third point about talking about the negotiations that are currently ongoing among the lower basin states in the United States um, on about what is called the lower basin drought contingency plan. The, the plan itself is an insurance policy to provide more, more certainty and greater protections against the risk of low reservoir elevations. Um, the process is led by the United States and uh, the Lower Basin Principles. Um, it, it sort of built on the initial project, the, the initial progress of the MOU and the pilot system conservation. Um, it has identified key concepts, but those concepts really are additional reductions, reductions so great that they're um, adequate enough to sort of bend the curve of what we see, the projections of declining reservoir elevations. <clears throat> upper basin, the coordination or communication with the, other, with the upper basin is also a part of this LBDCP process. So what is the plan? The plan proposes new reductions to lower basin users over and above those reductions identified in the 07 guidelines um, there, by each of the lower basin states and a conservation commitment by the United States. Um, the plan includes earlier and larger reductions over the 07 uh, guidelines by Arizona and Nevada. Um, it, for the first time, includes reductions by California at lower lake elevations. Um, Mexico is going to be asked to participate in the LBDCP in minute 32X. Um, those negotiations are ongoing but my understanding is that the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan needs to be implemented first before Mexico can move ahead with a commitment for additional reductions under Minute 32X. Again, these reductions are overlaid on top of the 07 guidelines. So this chart here shows the uh, proposed reductions under the Lower Basin uh, Drought Contingency Plan. Um, it shows the Mead trigger elevations um, and it shows the totals that would be required of each state. Um, you see significantly there, starting at elevation 1090, which we are, we've, we've gone past, um, Arizona would start taking a reduction of 192,000 acre feet a year. Um, at 1075, at a tier one shortage, Arizona shortage would go up, its reductions would um, go up to 512,000 acre feet a year. Um, Nevada has additional reductions over the 07 guidelines, um, and I don't want to minimize them, but they are small relative to Arizona reduc Arizona's reductions, and that's by virtue of the, the size of Nevada's entitlement compared to Arizona's entitlement. Um, critically, you see here that California does start taking reductions at elevation 1045. Um, those reductions increase by 50,000 acre feet for every uh, five feet of elevation drop below 1045. The United States has a conservation commitment of 100,000 acre feet. Um, this is um, sort of equal to the loss of the, the bypass flows from the failure to operate the YDP. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's parallel to that, and that's partially how they arrived at the 100,000 acre foot level. Um, and the, the Mexico reductions you see here are really just the minute 319 reductions. Um, it's important to recognize that at low elevations, at 130, um, the, uh, the, the total reductions that will be taken by lower basin 
parties um, exceed the structural deficit. So this is a graphic showing, a block chart showing ex the existing reductions under the 07 guidelines. The orange blocks are Arizona's reductions. The, what color is that? Purple show the Nevada reductions and the green um, are Mexico's contributions or reductions. Here we are overlaying the DCP on top of that. You see the United States reduction there in blue. Um, Arizona's reductions have significantly increased. We see California there for the first time. This is sort of an ideogram to give you an idea, just a general concept of we are doing a lot. The 07 guidelines propose significant reductions, but DCP is, is proposing even more. Uh, the takeaway from this is really from a mass balance approach at low reservoir elevations. Uh, these reductions are going to be equivalent to the uh, structural deficit. <clears throat> and finally here, uh, these are two modeling scenarios stacked on top of each other, um, predicting the uh, probability of reaching low reservoir elevations. The top scenario is without DCP. The bottom scenario is with DCP. Um, we see the modeling shows that the, the risks have been flattened, if you will, bending the curve of risk, and that we, there is a higher probability of lower basin staying out of uh, dangerously low uh, reservoir elevations. The uh, DCP is still under negotiation. Um, the parties had, I, still, I think it still remains their hope to have an agreement executed by the necessary parties before the, this administration leaves office. Um, right now the process is somewhat, it's not really stalled, it's just on a hiatus while the states themselves have their own intrastate uh, process to determine how reductions within each state will be shared. Arizona is having its own conversations right now about um, how the reductions will impact the CAP supplies. Are there ways to mitigate those users that are impacted? Of course, our ag priority users have the, they uh, will be hit hardest and first. Um, and we're having sort of conversations about are there ways to mitigate, are there ways to soften the impacts from these reductions. Um, also conversations about can some of the Arizona on-river users share these reductions that uh, Arizona will be signing up for. In California, the conversations, again, are about how those reductions are going to be shared among the contractors in California. They've also um, identified that they want some process certainty with respect to resolution of Salton Sea issues and Bay Delta issues. Um, and in August, that looked like it was going to be an impossibility, but I have heard reports that um, there's movement on, on both fronts, um, and things look a lot m more positive, at least than they did in August, about the ability of California to figure uh, its internal problems out and to be able to move forward with a DCP. <clears throat> so in summary, um, Lake Mead, uh, we know, has been declining. It continues decline, to decline because of the drought and really because of the structural deficit. Um, we realized several years ago that the reductions we agreed to in the 07 guidelines are not enough, that more must be done. Um, our investment in basin-wide conservation efforts have been successful, but they aren't enough. Um, so additional actions are needed to address the risks of the critical declines in meat elevation, and the DCP uh, aims to address a large portion of the current risks in the system. And I thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.
Yeah, um, I, I refer to, to, to probably two. So the Yuma Mesa fallowing program, that is actual fallowing, fallowing where land is fallowed. It would have been otherwise produced and it's not fallowed. And uh, part of the verification process is we go out and verify that there aren't crops planted on that land. So that is an actual taking out of production. Um, the MOU process, where some of our CAP ag users have agreed to forbear a portion of their CAP entitlement um, in exchange for us providing them cheaper water. Some of those folks did not uh, choose to plant crops. Some of them, though, switched to an alternative supply. They do have access to groundwater, and so they, they switched to, to groundwater. Um, and they, so it's it's not just one way, it's been several ways. But the, the major one, that pilot following program, that was actually lands out of production. So, um, line up with the microphone if you would. I don't think it's, oh, it is working, gotcha. <clears throat> so based on your, um, uh, one of the projects that you guys have already undertaken, which is the, the aquifer storage and recovery, you've got three plus million acre feet stored, which would imply that over the last decade or two, you've had an excess of water uh, relative to your consumptive use. So given that, how much of a reduction would actually be required before you'd have to tap into that, that water bank? So those, um, that water has been banked um, for specific reasons um, based on Arizona law and tribal settlements. Um, so the, the there are specific purposes and reasons on and times in which we can pull on that water. Um, the, it's banked for tribal farming purposes under a couple Indian water rights settlements in Arizona. Those tribes received uh, an allocation of what's called non-Indian ag priority water. Um, there is a priority system of water within C the CAP, the lowest priority water is pure excess which is, you know, it's just other excess. It's like unused entitlement. The CAP supply is fully allocated, but not, it's not fully, demands aren't fully developed. The next supply is our ag pool. Um, below that is the non-Indian non ag priority pool. And then beyond, below that, the highest priority is the municipal and industrial pool and the Indian priority pool. So the non-Indian ag pool is gonna be cut. It will be cut in DCP. Um, it could in experience a nick even under a, a f uh, first level DCP of 192, 192,000 acre feet. Um, there may be some recovery required to firm some of the tribal water in those settlements. Um, the majority of that water has been stored to firm the CAP municipal and industrial, the highest priority pool water. Um, we will not, it, our projections show that firming of that, that that supply will not be impacted um, for a number of years out, um, at least 10. And that's really assuming sort of really dire circumstances. So we don't believe that that firming obligation is gonna, for the M&I pool is going to manifest itself for at least 10 years. Um, and then, yeah. Suzanne, if, if you were to be delivering that same kind of message because you represented the upper basin, we'd be pulling people off the ceiling <laughs> looking at those kinds of reductions. So the question is, um, for your water community and your general population in Arizona, are, are they reckoning with this yet? And what kind of feedback are you getting? It's nice to be here with friendly people. <laughs> it's... Uh, it, and I don't, not to make light, I shouldn't make light of, I'm not making light of it. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard sell and people are having a hard time um, grappling with the, the size of the reductions and the nature of the impacts. Um, the proposed reductions themselves, they have a consequence of firming up or making more secure the highest priority pools in the CAP supply, the municipal and industrial and Indian priority pools. Um, 
but even those beneficiaries are having a hard time saying, well, we're not really sure we believe the risks. We're not really sure it's worth it. Um, so even the beneficiaries themselves are questioning, are, 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 are struggling. Um, and then you have those folks that are really being impacted and they may not actually get a benefit from, from the reductions in terms of firming, like our ag pool, particip our ag pool folks. So um, it's, it, there's difficult times um, and it's a hard, uh, the state CAP users are being asked to do a very hard thing. Um, but as I outlined before, you know, there's sobering and harsh realities about what we are facing. The risk is significant. It's an existential threat to CAP and the state. Um, and we believe that this is the path forward. I have another question if nobody else does. Um, o over the years, uh, CAP's put a lot of water into the ground, mm -hmm. into the storage. Uh, you know, have you tested it? Can you get it out? It, how can it help remedy this situation? Because it has been a significant part of, of what, how CAP has operated ground storage. Right. Um, yeah, recovery is an important part of our planning efforts. Uh, we've completed a recovery plan. We actually um, did a proof of concept. We did some interstate storage for the state of California, and we recovered and effectively forbore our diversions off the river, and uh, so they could take it and recovered and sup recovered the stored water and supplemented our supplies. So there is a proof of concept. We know how to pump groundwater out of the ground. Um, we haven't actually. Th there's meth types of methods and involving exchange of credits and complicated methods. Um, the most costly method would be um, pumping the, the, the stored water out of the ground and discharging it into the CAP system and then transporting it through the system. Um, that is costly and complicated. It would require a, a new agreement with the United States about how we can use the CAP infrastructure to do that. In some circumstances, it might uh, uh, require water treatment, um, but there are uh, other more straightforward yet uh, more less costly uh, ways that we can effectuate recovery. Well, I just saw that you have only two minutes left, so I'm going to throw out two questions that I know you can't possibly answer in that period of time, but I'll throw it out just for discussion and maybe further discussion. One, I'm questioning. Has, has there been any discussion about the value of the uses of the water? And my experience has been being in Nevada and Arizona where I'm surrounded by green grass golf course and a lot of turf and, and it just seems kind of crazy in a place where it's 120 degrees. And then second, more radical, there's been discussion about removing Lake Mead and saving all that evapotranspiration by just relying on Lake Powell. So that's another wild one for you. <laughs> there's, always con there's always ongoing discussions about conservation and how we can do more within the service area to, to conserve water. So yes, those conversations are ongoing. Um, and I'm not really prepared to discuss the concept of uh, <laughs> eliminating Lake Mead. Thank you, everyone.